need that? Normally our men come forward, so she was waiting for them to come forward, and I went and told her they weren't coming forward because I knew you didn't want to keep looking at Randy. So uh, <laughs> thank you for your patience on that. And the children are dismissed for Children's Church. Appreciate the children uh, singing. Uh, we had a big group sing this morning at first service as well, and uh, we just enjoyed them all week, and thank you for bringing them. And uh, we had one of our biggest VBSs in the past several years, so it was great to have all these young people. Well, we're going to start out as we do each week. We're going to share together by reading 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. When I was growing up, we went to the beach nearly every summer for vacation. And uh, we went to Virginia Beach when I was younger. Later, we went to Myrtle Beach when I was a little bit older. And no matter what beach or what age, when we would get to the beach, there would always be these guidelines established. My parents would say, all right, see that lifeguard stand right there? See that striped, blue and white striped umbrella, beach umbrella right there? You got to stay in between those two, all right? Stay in between. Don't go past that stand. Don't go past that umbrella. And then they would say, and don't go too deep into the water, all right? I want you to stay closer to shore. But, you know, every child knows the shells and the sand, it's, it's better past the lifeguard stand. You know, it's, it's better past the umbrella, and you can't really ride a wave unless you go a little deep and, and, and catch that wave. So what we would do, we'd let our parents get preoccupied or fall asleep. And dads always fall asleep when they're laying on the beach, all right? And then guess what we would do? We'd go a little farther than the lifeguard stand. We'd go a little farther than the umbrella. We'd go out a little bit deeper to, to catch that wave. You know, obeying authority seems to be a problem for many, and it starts young. But even as adults, we struggle. I mean, the speed limit's 55, and what do we know? We know the state trooper will give us five miles an hour. So we take that five, and then what do we do? Well, we take one or two more. We can blame it on a hill or the cruise control. So soon we're, we're going 62 miles an hour. Or we see those signs like, do not enter, no U-turn, no left turn, and what do we do? We read those signs, and then we look this way and that way and look back, and then we do it. We go for it, don't we? Uh, or that 12-item or less line at the store, and we have 19 items, and what do we do? We justify it. Well, we're under 20, but it says 12, but we sneak our 19 items through the line. Things like not talking means we whisper. Uh, be honest. Does, does it eat at you until you remove that do not remove tag? Do you just have to do it? Authority. Everyone struggles with it on some level. Well, this week we had a wonderful week of, of vacation Bible school, and there you kind of see the entire crew uh, that was here on, on Friday night for our performance. And I told Bailey the first night of vacation Bible school, I said, you need to have two rules, two big rules. Get this across. I said, first, no one's on stage, and please don't touch the animals. In the entryway, we had animals down there, or up on stage. Don't touch the animals. We want to use them for years, and they were very expensive. And then I said, the second thing I want you to do is tell them, when my hand goes up, that means the mouth goes shut. All right? Now, that worked okay. Uh, not great. As the week got going on, they got a little bit rowdier, rowdier and rowdier. It worked less, but it, it was better than yelling, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet all week. Well, it was funny. At the closing program, Bailey just walked up, didn't say anything to anyone, and just stood there like this. And all the parents were like, what in the world is this guy doing? You know, he's just standing there like that. 
But the kids understood. They began to quiet down. As far as touching the animals, I saw this four-year-old go up to one of the animals in the, in the entryway, and she did one of these. She like looked this way and looked that way. Touched one. She just had to touch it. You know, just had to touch it. We've got to do it, even when we're not supposed to. We just struggle with authority. Well, Romans 13, beginning with verse 1, Paul writes these words. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do this or do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on those who are the wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Well, we're in a sermon series right now titled Sandy Beaches and Deep Waters. And we've learned about putting too much faith in sandcastles, the stuff of this world. And we have learned that we need to put our faith in Jesus so that we can walk on water even through the storms of life. Well, this morning, we turn our attention to an Old Testament deep water story. It's a story most of us are familiar with. It's the story of Jonah and the whale. You know, I, I learned this week, or at least was reminded this week, that whales are actually not uh, considered a fish. A whale is a mammal. Mammals are all warm-blooded animals. They breathe air, they have hair, and their moms can feed them milk. Well, whales actually do these things. They're able to do those things, and, and they have hair, so they're not a fish, they're a mammal. However, they do live in the ocean, and may have been the behemoth described that swallowed Jonah. Uh, the blue whale is the largest whale. And I don't know if you know this, but it can grow to be 82 foot long. 82 feet long. They can weigh as much as 330,000 pounds. That's 165 tons. This size fish or mammal could certainly swallow a human. In the book of Jonah, we find something we all have in common. At some time or another in our life, every one of us have, have looked at God and, and we've said no, or we've run away from God. We've looked at God at some time in our life and said, leave me alone. I'm okay. I can handle it. My will, not your will. Sometime in our life, we've run from God. And in many ways, Perhaps some of us in areas of our life are doing that very thing today, running away from God. Now, you may look at the story of Jonah and think that this story could not be true. It, it, you may consider it to be a Pinocchio-type story. It's a fairy tale or a fable. But I believe this story is true for two reasons. First of all, if God can say, let there be light, and there's light, if God can create the moon and the earth and the stars, if he can create man out of dust, then he can uh, figure out how to allow a fish to swallow a man and that man live in that fish for three days. I also believe, the second reason I believe it to be true, is, is that Jesus stated in his teachings that it was true. In Matthew 12, 40, it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus taught that. And what is Jesus? He's the truth. Jesus does not lie. So if he says, just as Jonah was three days in the belly of a huge fish, it's the truth. He's saying it's the truth, and we must believe it. The story happened. The story is true. And we can relate to this story again because every one of us at some time or another have tried to hide or run from God. Every one of us have, has told God no at some point in our lives. Perhaps we haven't jumped on a ship, hidden deep within a ship, to try to run away or hide from God. But, but Paul writes this to the Roman 
the church at Rome in Romans 3, 22 and 23. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew or Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we fall short. We leave God over here, and we go over there. Or we give God the leftovers. Perhaps we give God 25% or 40% or 65% or 70, uh, 70 or 75% of our lives, but that's still falling short. We say to God, I will give you this part of my life, but not this part of my life. And perhaps we just run occasionally, miss worship, miss communion, go several months without serving, make plans, make excuses, justify, but it, it's all running. Uh, it's all running away. Now, why do we run from God? Why do we say no and run away when we should say yes and run to God? Well, the same reason Adam and Eve ran from God. Uh, we think we know better. Uh, we start thinking we can do this life on our own. We can do it our way. Start looking at our will instead of God's will. And what we need to understand is that we can't just say, God, save me. God, protect me. God, heal me. God, help me. But in this area of my life, leave me alone. Can't say that. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. All right? So Paul shares here that, that everyone's tempted to run. Tempted to say no to God, yes to the world. Tempted to seek their will instead of God's will. But the good news is you don't have to run. The good news is you can stand under your situation and be found righteous. Now, so far this morning, perhaps you're thinking, I'm a runner, all right? He's talking about me. The preacher's talking about me this morning. I I'm a runner. Well, take heart. You're in a room full of runners or at least former runners. What we must understand is we can run from God, but we can't outrun God. He knows, he sees, and he holds us accountable. Jonah ran from God. Jonah would be held accountable. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to encourage you to turn to Jonah chapter 1. and We're going to begin with verses 1 and 2 this morning. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. So Nineveh was this city that God continued to reach out to. He would reach out and they would say no. They would continue in their wickedness. They would continue to run from God. But God, for some reason, probably just because he's God, he loved Nineveh. And he wanted to save them. So he gives them yet another chance. He's going to send his prophet Jonah to Nineveh to share his message so that they might be saved. However, there's a problem. Notice verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach my message. And Jonah says, no. And Jonah runs away. Now, Nineveh was 500 miles from Joppa with, with donkeys or a horse. You could perhaps get there in a couple of weeks. It would take Jonah, however, going the opposite direction to Tarshish about five months to get there because it was 2,500 miles away, a five-month trip across the, the ocean, uh, a water full of storms and sharks and violent water. Jonah says, I would rather go there. And here's why. Here's why Jonah would rather go to Tarshish and take his chance on the sea instead of going to Nineveh. Jonah wanted the people of Nineveh to be punished. He wanted God to punish them for their wickedness. And Jonah knew that God is a loving God, and Jonah knew that God would forgive them. So this running goes beyond rebellion. Jonah was imposing his will and ignoring God's will. Now, if I was running from God, the last thing I would do is get on a ship. 
I mean, I think the Titanic, I think perfect storm, all right? You go out in the ocean far enough, and there are things that can eat you, okay? There are things that can eat you. So I'm not getting on a wooden ship with no satellite weather reports and trying to hide and run from God. It's not going to happen, but that's exactly what Jonah does. Which leads us to our first lesson from this deep water story. And that is when we run, we run to ridiculous places. We really do. Think about it. People run to drugs. They run towards bad relationships. They run to bad company that corrupts good character. They run to work. They run to clubs. They run to bars. They run to hobbies. They run to get away. They run to get away from accountability. They run to get away from authority. We had a couple runners this week at VBS, all right? We did. Young children running out of the CLC, running out of the classroom, running out of the craft area, running out of the snack area. Somebody asked after first service, who would run out of snack area? I said, well, they'd already eaten their snack, but then they wanted to get free. Well, we caught them, all right? So don't worry, we caught them. But what were they running from? Authority. They wanted to do what they wanted to do, and they didn't want to be in the CLC or the craft area or the classroom anymore. When I was preaching in Virginia, back when I, I first started as a, as a youth minister, uh, I was preaching. It was kind of like this. The podium was there and the communion table was there. And all of a sudden, this two-year-old, he gets loose from his mother. And he comes busting down the front aisle. And he's about to make the turn. And I was kind of over this way more. Uh, so they were coming. He was coming straight for me. But he didn't make it because his mom's shoestring tackled him right there as he, as he made, the t- made the turn. And, and I kind of got quiet, and everybody else kind of got quiet while it was happening. And all I could think of was to say, you got him. You got him. And she did. She caught him. But what was he running from? He didn't want to sit in that pew anymore, all right? There's probably some wives here who got a hold of your husbands because he's going to make a run for it uh, here in a minute. But he wanted out, wanted away from the authority. We run from authority and we run to ridiculous places. And it starts at an early age. Think about others in God's word and where they ran to. Lot, as one of God's people, ran to a city of sin, Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he ran there. And we know the destruction that took place. Adam and Eve ran and made garments and then ran and tried to play hide and seek with God. David ran to Fi- the Philistines, his enemy, his worst enemy. Moses ran to the desert. Saul ran towards persecution. Peter ran towards denial. One disciple, on the night Jesus was arrested, ran away so fast the Bible says he ran out of his clothes. Mark 14, 50 through 52. Then everyone deserted Jesus and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. That's ridiculous. Running from God always makes us look bad. And Jonah chooses to hide in a, and run in a wooden ship, hauling freight for five months across an ocean. Ridiculous. And yet so many are doing the same thing today. I mean, think. Are you running towards your Tarshish and away from God today? Which leads us to the second lesson we notice from this deep water story, and that is when we run, we self-destruct. We self-destruct. When you run from God, your life starts falling apart, and here's why. When you turn and run from God, you are turning and running away from the truth, the truth that sets you free. You run away from His truth and create your own truth, and this is exactly what the world is doing today. They're taking immoral decisions and saying that God's okay with it when the Bible clearly says He's not. And guess what they're doing? They're creating their own truth instead of following the truth of God. Notice what Jesus says to those who do this very thing. He says in John 8, 44, you belong to the Father, the devil, to your Father, the devil, and you want to carry out your Father's desires. But he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Our lives self-destruct, our morals self-destruct when we run from God because we serve a liar instead of the truth. And the more we serve him, the liar, the more he lies until we're face down in the gutter 
or living lives that are face down in the gutter. Andy Stanley writes, what a tragedy, blowing through our 20s thinking it will happen in your 30s, and then you blow through your 30s thinking it will happen in your 40s, and now you're halfway through your 40s and you realize that life is just more this. And what is in front of you is just more of what is what was behind you. And he writes, and you sit up in bed with this feeling that your life has no purpose. Well, is your life like a treadmill, a never-ending circle of, of this world? Uh, and, and you're missing life. You're missing your purpose. You're feeling empty. And it's because you're running. Do you feel like you're hiding deep in the belly of a boat? headed nowhere good. When you run away from God slowly or quickly, your life will lose meaning, even fall apart. That's just the way it is. Let's notice Jonah's life in verse 4 as it begins to fall apart. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea, to lighten the ship's load. Now, again, this leads us to another lesson, our our third and final lesson this morning from this deep water story, and that is when we run, we always hurt those near to us. I mean, did you notice what's happening here? The sailors are doing what? They're throwing their cargo over, overboard. If they survive the storm, they will show up in Tarshish empty-handed Or they will have to turn around and go back to Joppa and have some explaining to do. They will have nothing. They'll probably be fired, perhaps even punished. No money for their families and no money meant no food. Uh, They were going to lose everything. Not because of something they had done, but because Jonah has said no to God, was running from God, and was hiding in their boat. You know, runners always hurt those close to them. The alcoholic hurts their family. The person who commits suicide hurts everyone close to them. Drugs destroy relationships, hurts people, run towards envy, boasting, greed, selfishness, and it will hurt those closest to you. That's just how it works. The runner runs, and those around the runner often pay for it. In our story, God's not back in Joppa saying, where's Jonah? God was right there in the ocean, right there creating a storm. You know, we see this often in God's Word. God's people will say, no, they'll run away, things fall apart. Then God hears their cry, comes back to them. Why? Because He's always right there, always present, always knowing. You cannot hide from God. You cannot outrun God. God loves us, and because He loves us, He'll jump into our lives at any moment. Uh, He will even fan the flames of pain to bring us back to him. He will go to the ends of the earth, or in this case, the case of Jonah, to the depths of the ocean to bring you back to him. Well, notice in Jonah chapter 1, beginning with with verse 6, it says, The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, we need to understand these lots here. In the Old Testament, God spoke to to us in many different ways. Uh, He spoke through his prophets like Jonah, uh, through dreams that would be interpreted. He would write on walls, speak through fire, through wind. He even spoke through the mouth of a donkey on one occasion. Another way he spoke was through the casting of lots. He would control the lots to speak his wishes. And we find this throughout the Old Testament, also in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the first two chapters of Acts. But when the Holy Spirit came into our life, when the Holy Spirit came from heaven to earth uh, with the early church and came into our hearts, he stopped speaking to us in those ways. However, this is an Old Testament story, so he's still speaking this way. They cast lots and Well, lots land on Jonah. Jonah knew that they would. This is no random storm. God has been looking uh, for Jonah. Remember, I said at the beginning of the sermon, we are held 
accountable. Let's notice verses 8 through 11. So they ask him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do, do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us. If you continue to reading that part of the story, what they did is they took him and threw him overboard. And when they threw him overboard, the, the waters calmed down. You see, Jonah realized at this point that God doesn't chase you. God is always already there waiting for you. God doesn't look for you. He's already found you. So that at so that at that moment, he's there so that when you turn and stop running, you will find him. He can receive you. He can save you. Jonah is in the water at first fighting the storm, and then probably even worse, nearly drowned. He's in the middle of the ocean with no one or, or nothing. But notice what happens next. Verse 17, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, just like Jesus would teach in, in a thousand or so years. The, the key word here is provided. God provided. I don't know how he did it, but he did. I don't know how he does it, but he does. He always provides just what we need at, at just the right time, and and he provides throughout the story, provided in verse 4 with what? Sending the wind. Provided in verse 7 with a fish or a mammal that swallowed him. Uh, provided in verse 17 uh, as well as he was in that fish. And then if you read the conclusion of the story, he provided for Jonah because the fish spit him back up on land. And then he made his way to Nineveh. He provides throughout the story. Do you know what God will let your life fall apart. Do you know why? It's not payback. It's to bring you back. And that was probably the lowest point in Jonah's life, to be living alive inside a huge fish. But it wasn't payback. It was to bring him back. And he does that. God does that because he loves you. So I want to finish up with several hard questions this morning. Number one, are you running from God? Ask yourself that question. With your life or a part of your life, are you running away from righteousness? Number two, are you saying no to God today? Has he asked you to be committed to his church and you're saying or have said no? Has he asked you to use the gifts he has given you for his glory and you said no? Has he asked you to change a part of your life and you just continue to say no? Has he asked you to sacrifice and you have just said no. Has he asked you uh, to do his will? But you're saying, no, I'm going to do my will. Are you saying no to God today? And then number three, have you brought a storm upon yourself or those closest to you? Because of your bad choices, have you hurt the innocent? Have you hurt those around you because you've rejected God, ran away from him, and said no? Well, if you answered yes to one of those or all three of those questions this morning, I have good news for you. And the good news is found in God's Word, and we're going to finish with this. I'm just going to read these three texts. The first one is James 5.15. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. The good news is you can be forgiven this morning. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You can be pure and holy this morning through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then finally, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You can be forgiven. You can be made pure. 
you can be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. But you've got to run to him, not away from him. But as the worship leaders come this morning, if you have a decision to make to run toward God, I encourage you to make it. As we stand and sing our invitation hymn this morning, please stand and sing.